the camera. Just give it, give it, give it off, give it off, give down, it, down. Give it. You know, dinosaurs are perhaps the coolest thing that ever walked the face of the earth, but even they weren't cool enough to survive a little tiny meteor strike lo those millions of years ago. Since discovering this little fact, humanity has fretted over the possibility of a meteor coming for us and has decided not only to try and raise its average coolness by elevating the likes of John Hamm and Ryan Gosling to stardom, but also creating thousands of nuclear weapons with which to strike any errant asteroids that even think about coming towards Earth. But have we done enough? That summer saw the release of not one, but two films that featured large objects plummeting the Earth and incinerating everything in their path. I'm talking, of course, about Deep Impact and Armageddon, films that were released within two months of each other, which both somehow fixated on the end of all humanity. Depressing? Not if you're Michael Bay, the end of the world merely being an excuse to watch American flags flap in the wind and contrive a way for oil drillers to save the planet. Deep Impact treats its subject matter more seriously, but it's still mostly a bad movie. When you were a baby, uh I once dropped you on your head. To quickly recap, both films feature the discovery of a miles-wide comet or asteroid plunging towards Earth that will destroy all life unless it is somehow dealt with. How to take on this challenge? Science. Send a mostly heroic crew of astronauts up to the rocky body, plant some nukes, and attempt to fragment the civilization killer before it can actually kill civilization. Both films feature a bit of CGI death porn by showing the impact of smaller meteors and the destruction of large swaths of humanity, but in the end, the NASA crews in both films managed to complete their mission, albeit not without a few losses along the way. But which one's better, you ask? To the uncool layman, you might have to rely on the subjective opinion of your movie critics or tomato meters. But here on screen, we have another tool at our disposal. It's science. I am, of course, referring to science. Let's start breaking down these movies into categories, assigning some numbers, and find out which one is proven better by our completely objective scientific analysis. Shall we? Least applause worthy survival. Millions of people die in each of these films, but the bulk of humanity survives. That's not always a good thing though, especially in the case of Armageddon, where New York was bombarded by meteorites early in the film. Michael Bay's never met a minority he couldn't make fun of, and he proves it by shoving Eddie Curry into a cab with a set of Asian tourists. I want to go shopping! Me too! <laughs> and of course, Eddie Griffin manages to conveniently survive a point blank encounter with a meteorite that kills a man he's five inches away from. I wanted all these people to die. I would have been perfectly happy if the little French bulldog was the only person to survive this sequence, but alas. Somebody down 911! Michael Bay might be a little bit racist, but not racist enough to indulge in the old the black guy dies first cliche here. That honor goes to a Samoan. I give Armageddon 8 out of 10 in this category. Deep Impact does at least have the decency to kill off the most annoying member of its cast, but it does finish on a shot that is supposed to be inspirational but winds up merely annoying. After a massive wave has killed millions of people and destroyed most of the eastern seaboard, we're supposed to stand and cheer when the president announces a return to normalcy by standing in front of the Capitol building being rebuilt, because obviously our greatest concern after a meteor strike is whether or not Congress has a place to work. Still, no Eddie Griffin to be seen, so... 7 out of 10. Best President. Michael Bay somehow manages to avoid implementing too many presidentialisms in Armageddon, even if he can't help throw in some speechifying. The Bible calls this day Armageddon. Unfortunately, he can't come up with anything better for his presidential casting than the standard old white guy that he employs in so many of his films. The Bible Boring. Calls this day 2 out of 10 the end of all things. Director Mimi Letter went for the big guns and deep impact on the other hand, classing the join up by installing Morgan Freeman in the Oval Office. When he's not acting circles around poor deer in the headlights Tay Leone, he's addressing the nation with a kind of calmness that anyone would be hard pressed to summon considering the fact that we're all going to die. This comet is larger than Mount Everest. It weighs 500 billion tons. While he might not have been the first black president in a movie, I think we can all agree that he'd be preferable to have in the office than Tony Tiny Lister from The Fifth Element. 9 out of 10. Life will go on. Best Worst Newscast. Speaking of presidents, the president in Armageddon lets loose with a lot of pretty words on the occasion of the launch of the space shuttles that will theoretically save mankind. 
It is a speech that is apparently heard by every single person on Earth. Many of them by the quaint use of quaint old radios, many of them apparently only capable of moving in slow motion. It is the apotheosis of a speech in a Michael Bay film. Sounds good, it's easy to listen to while American flags slowly flap in the background, and you don't remember any of it as soon as it's over. Eh, 5 out of 10. Taya Leone, though, manages to top even that in Deep Impact. She gets one little scoop and somehow manages to go from background researcher to lead anchor in a matter of days, which should really say a lot about the professionalism of MSNBC. Also, MSNBC. Oh, and did I mention MSNBC? MSNBC! Were Leone's character real, she'd be in the running for worst reporter ever, right up there with Nancy Grace and the guy who has a bug fly in his mouth. Every line is delivered with all the zeal of a zombie seeking brains. Sometime in the next hour, the Messiah mission will enter its most critical phase. And in that sense, she delivers some of the best worst newscasts in modern film history. 9 out of 10. Best father daughter moment. Despite an audience member's best attempt at ironic detachment, Bay and his writers do know how to pluck at those heartstrings with assassin like precision. And if you haven't been deafened by 130 minutes of explosions and gunfire and jokes about buttholes, I just came here to drill. So did I! Bruce Willis's last little message to little Tyler is actually mildly touching, given that he sacrifices himself to save humanity and also his daughter's future husband. Decent enough for a Bay film, and it's always fun to watch your girlfriend cry in a movie theater. At least you're not watching a Nicholas Sparks movie. 6 out of 10. Deep Impact, on the other hand, sends our newscaster heroine and her father to the beach, where they await their climactic end as a gigantic wave comes to crush them horribly to death. By the time this finally transpires, you wish for nothing more than the sweet relief that can only come when Taya Leone finally stops speaking for good in the film. And watching her get swept away under a trillion tons of water certainly seems to ensure that that is the outcome. Before their imminently timely deaths, though, Maximilian Schell does let loose with a little anecdote that explains everything. When you were a baby, I, I once dropped you on your head. Your definition of best might vary from mine, but finally seeing Leone die is so satisfying that I have to give this an 8 out of 10. Daddy. Best tension raising early film explosion. In Armageddon, we're told on no uncertain terms that the asteroid in question means business when debris it shot at Earth manages to blow up a space shuttle. There's no oxygen in space, and therefore no explosions, meaning that this asteroid is so goddamn serious that it's even capable of bending the laws of physics. That is not science. 3 out of 10. Play that tape back. Deep Impact saves its comic strike for well into the second half of the film. But you can't have a film go explosionless for that long, leading to an interminable sequence on a mountaintop where an astronomer's car is going to get hit by a truck any second now. Wait for it. On. Okay. And there. Unfortunately for the astronomer in question, he forgot to unload his wife's supply of pipe bombs and napalm from the trunk before peeling out, resulting in this memorable explosion. And amazingly, he walked away unharmed. 8 out of 10. Hmm. Best consequence explaining late film rock impact. Again, Deep Impact's first comet hit doesn't occur until pretty late in the film, after the comet has been split into a small and a large half. The smaller half manages to splash down in the Atlantic, but the tidal wave manages to obliterate most of the eastern seaboard, as demonstrated by a memorable little sequence detailing the destruction of New York City. For a 13-year-old film, the effects are competently done, and it is, of course, always fun to see lots of people dying a lot. 8 out of 10. Bay, on the other hand, spreads his asteroid strikes throughout the film, first destroying parts of New York, then destroying Shanghai, and finally taking out the bulk of Paris with one last fireball. Considering that large cities take up probably well less than 1% of the Earth's surface area, it's shockingly malevolent of that asteroid to keep targeting. That said, if Bay's good at anything, it's in making things blow up real nice. A tie at 8 out of 10. In 
conclusion. Out of a total possible score of 60, Armageddon takes a 32, while Deep Impact comes in with a stunning 49 points. Michael Bay may never have found a flag he couldn't wave, a lens he couldn't flare, or a mo he couldn't slow, but he'll have to try harder the next time he's involved in a little side grades action. That's because the objective analysis provided by the side grades computers have conclusively proven that Armageddon is only 65% as good as Deep Impact is. It's science. Hopefully he'll be able to live with himself and get back out there and make some more movies after learning of this judgment. That's all the time we have time for here on this timely edition of Side Grades, but we'll be back next time, just in time for a look at another pair of curiously similar films released within the same year. We'll see you then.